circles. You can come and look if you want to. In the halls you'll see no mantles, but the light shines dim all around you. The streets are paved with gold. If someone asks, you can call my name. You can call my name. You can call my name. Um, I played with Robert Plant. The first time I played with Robert Plant was actually 1997. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a bit. And then I formed a band with him in 1999, which lasted right to the end of 2000, early 2001. Obviously playing with Robert Plant is an incredible experience to um, have, have gone through and I learned such a lot about it. But the biggest thing I learned was about making music, creating music, and uh, it also Robert opened my ears to so many different music forms. Um, he got me into so much different stuff at that time. You know, I, I he would call me over to his house and we'd sit down and he had this fast record collection and we'd listen to all sorts of different stuff. He had some incredible jazz in there. You know, I can remember listening to Keith Jarrett, Coltrane, all sorts of different stuff. Um, one album that he actually gave me, I, I can remember going over to his house, you know, when we first formed the band and he went to his record collection, he pulled out an album and gave it me and said, you need to have a copy of this, uh, this album, which is Forever Changes by Love. And I really think this is one of the greatest rock albums of all time. I think in terms of rock music, historically, I really feel that the great strides in rock music were done in, in England. And Robert was actually a part of that, you know, although later on, you know, um, Jimmy Page was a part of it right from the very start. I think rock music, the idea of rock music that turns into progressive rock, that turns into psychedelic rock, or, you know, garage, garage rock, you know, all these forms of music, even jazz fusion. I think that those that form is really forged in 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 the uk in london in the early 60s with bands like graham bond brian auger john mayle you know alexis corner who of course robert sang for at a, at a certain point in time in america it's actually much more obtuse you can hear the beginnings of, of heavy metal what the black sabbath do with, with iron butterfly um, but i think with the doors and especially love they, this is where America really um, is creatively playing its part in the formation of rock music. And I mean rock music as opposed to rock and roll or rhythm and blues and all that sort of music. I mean rock music, you know. And I think Love is so important and this album is so important in terms of really laying the, the foundations for sort of not just psychedelic rock, acid rock, but also progressive rock and even jazz fusion to a certain extent. This is a really important album. So as I say, Robert gave me this album. This is the album I'm bringing in. You know, this pick up picture of the genius Arthur Lee on the back. You know, the real mastermind behind this incredible band. You know, so if you don't know this album, go and check it out. Absolutely incredible. Um, it opens up with Alone Again All, which is one of the greatest tunes of all time. Um, and these are tunes that I used to play with Robert in, in the band I was in. So when I played with Robert, I played and we formed a band called The Priory of Brian. That, that uh, name was a sort of play on words. It was a, it was a play on uh, the life of Brian. I don't know whether Robert saw, you know, ramifications between himself and somebody had, had been misdiagnosed as being the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I don't know whether <laughs> that had ramifications for him. And it also related to Pri Priory of Zion, which was a, 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 whole, a, a secret society, which was sort of, had been given the task over centuries of looking after the Holy Grail and was linked into Jesus' bloodline. And, and those two things were put together, sort of mysterious organization, because when we formed the band, for the first few gigs, it was kept a secret. You know, we, 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 we would appear in tiny little clubs, you know, under this weird pseudonym, and people would have to work out that it was Robert, you know. 
Um, so these are tracks that I used to play. This is why I've got the album. I learned them. You know, I think that we used to play Alone Again or A House Is Not A Motel. Um, and I think uh, Bummer In The Summer, those are the three tracks that we played off at this album. So how did I get with the gig with Robert? Well, um, I've, I've pulled a few things. I've got boxes of, of, of stuff that I'm going to show you. This video is going to be a little bit different. Um, so um, in 1997, um, Robert, who was best friends with a guy called Kevin Gammon, who I'd known for years. Um, um, Kevin Gavin taught at the same college I taught at. And Kevin himself is an incredible legend. You know, he was um, originally the guitarist with Jimmy Cliff in the 1960s. He then formed the Band of Joy with Robert Platt and John Bonham. And he went on to play with Jimmy Witherspoon and he formed a band uh, called Bronco that was... That, um, were on Island Records, um, you know. So he, you know, Kev had had a real incredible career, you know. Played with all the greats, and I know Kev for many years. And and I think, you know, him and Robert got their heads together and said it would be fun to sort of revisit their time in the Band of Joy. And there was a local gig, um, which was just a charity gig in a in a in a in a tennis club. Um, and, you know, I think Robert said, you know, do you want to play? And he goes, yeah, I'll get my mate Andy in on drums. So I came in and did this one-off gig. Now, I've got a photograph of, from that gig. And I'm going to try and hold it up here and show you. That is a photograph. If I can get the light off it, I'll hold it. Oh, this is going to be awful, isn't it? This is, this, this is um, graphically how my videos work. You know, I don't have any of this, you know, technological nonsense. This is how I show you. So I'll bring that in. There's the very first um, gig I ever did with Robert in 1997, around about November 1997, in a little um, tennis club to around about, probably around about 100 people. And, and we played a whole bunch of, um, you know, covers and stuff like that, a lot of 1960s psychedelic stuff. And um, once we'd done the gig, you know, Rob actually called me up and said, oh, you know, I really enjoyed that. You know, he was doing Page and Plant at that time. So he was sort of touring, doing stadiums. And uh, he said, oh, I'd... I'd, I'd I really enjoyed it. Do you want to get together and jam a bit more? And we did. And um, I eventually, for a variety of reasons, I was I was going off to Australia and a whole bunch of stuff. I couldn't, you know, I had to actually sort of turn Robert down and say, you know, I can't do any more rehearsing, Robert. I've got to go um, off to Australia. And Robert turned around and said, well, we will, we, we will do something, which I just thought, yeah, yeah, brilliant, you know. In 1999... Um, he then gets in contact again. He goes, I want to do something. Um, and we booked another little tiny gig that we played secretly. And I've got here the poster that we created. I think we created it on, on um, Robert's sort of printer in his house. The very first poster for the very first gig that uh, I ever did with the Priory O'Brien. There it is. And they're not even, we changed the, you know, the Priory O'Brien eventually got spelt Brian was B-R-I-O-N, you know, and there it is, Friday the 23rd of July, 1999, I think, at the Three Tons pub in Bishop's Castle. That was the first gig we ever did. And, um, you know, when the band started, we were playing a whole ton of stuff that I, I didn't really know. Robert's knowledge of music was, is, is incredible. His knowledge of the blues is absolutely vast, and he's got really incredible understanding of sort of North African music, but also psychedelic 60s music, a lot of folk music. And, um, you know, Robert really um, wanted to really pull those things to the fore, but he wanted us to rework them. I think he wanted us to be like those bands that were in the UK in the 60s that really formed rock and roll. And he wanted us to take these influences and turn them into our own thing, which is a very incredible and creative thing you know with tons of improvisation tons of jamming this is one of the most bizarre things for me when i look back on that experience of playing with robert um was as the gigs grew the gigs got bigger and bigger so when we first started playing we'd be playing to 100 200 people and then it was a thousand people then two thousand people and by the end the the gigs had outgrown the band the band really was at its best playing these tiny clubs um and you know, I think Robert's stature and his, his legacy and history outgrew the band, you know. But there was a point where we were doing 10, 20, 30,000 seater gigs. And, and yet we were still jamming 
like some 60s psychedelic band. You know, we would play a track and the whole middle section would just be an improvisation. You know, Robert was an incredible improviser. He, he could actually improvise lyrics, you know. He, you know, we'd be in some jam and he'd pick like a Bob Marley song and he'd bring the lyrics in and then suddenly the, the track would go off in a certain direction. Um, and all the way through this, Robert was continually educating us. I, I pulled out a letter that he... He sent me here. This is this is a letter here that which really um, he sent me while we we're in the midst of it. It says, "Hi Andy, you know," and he's basically saying, um, "Go and check out Ray Charles. He's amazing. Check out this tune and listen to his vocals on this tune. It's absolutely incredible." You know, he's he's going check out some James Brown. Listen to the sax solo on Think. It's amazing. It's it's not like. Um, this is the songs we're going to learn. He's just saying, go and check this music out. It's brilliant. And, and I think really prodding me as a drummer, you know, when I look at that and now I'm older and I sort of understand the, what was going back on back then. Because a lot of the time I didn't really understand what the hell Robert wanted. This was the education for me, you know. But obviously as a drummer, him saying, go and check out Ray Charles and go and check out James Brown, is he wanted that. He wanted that sound in the band at that time. He wanted me... To, to really check out those rhythm and blues drummers. I'd sort of come up from that myself, you know, a lot of jazz, you know, a lot of fusion and a lot of funk, you know, a, a lot of soul. You know, I'd grown up listening to bands like Rufus and Shaka Khan and Earth, Wind and Fire and, um, you know, James Brown and Parliament Funkadelic. That was where I was coming from. Um, but not so much Ray Charles and, you know, um, all these earlier rhythm and blues bands, they'd been a little bit before my time. But of course I got it. And I think, you know, when I look at, you know, I just pulled that letter out now and had a look at it. I thought, this is what Robert was trying to do. He was, he was, he was trying to bring out of me that thing that he knew I could do because I was coming out of that. And I'm sure with the other musicians, he was with the keyboard, he was like, check out this person. And then the guitarist, you know, check out this. So that all his influence would come in. I, I, and this was fascinating for me because um, I really, I really am interested in how music forms form. I think this is why this channel's here. So as a kid, you know, when I first heard the new wave of British heavy metal, that wasn't enough for me. So I had to do the research and I started to realise that these heavy metal bands had come out of heavy rock bands like Led Zeppelin, like Deep Purple. So I looked into those bands and then I realised Zeppelin had come out of a whole bunch of bands in the 60s like the Yardbirds and the Yardbirds then takes you back to this incredible fertile period in the 1960s when rock music is really being defined by a whole bunch of musicians and I found that fascinating and I would research into that. Um, exactly the same thing with this is how I got to jazz fusion, this is how I got to jazz, you know. Um, um, the, the thing that took me to Jazz Fusion was Jeff Beck. And Jeff Beck I'd got to through that rock route. And when I heard Wired by Jeff Beck, it just blew me away, you know. Um, as I've always said on this channel, my dad also had a Billy Cobb album and that helped, you know, because as soon as I discovered this thing called Jazz Fusion, I went, my dad's got an album. And, and, you know, and I went and checked out Crosswinds, which is now probably one of my favourite albums of all time because of that. And then that takes you towards Jazz Fusion, and then Jazz Fusion takes you to Miles Davis, takes you to Coltrane. And, you know, when I was growing up listening to Led Zeppelin, that's what I heard. I heard just this, this huge melting pot of different influences and sounds, you know. Um, also, and I don't talk about this on this channel so much, I've got a real strong interest in songwriting. You know, I, I grew up listening to bands like The Police and Madness and The Specials. These are all the bands I loved when I was a kid. And, you know, that's more about pop songwriting and songwriting. And I, you know, I, I became very interested when I was quite young in artists like John Martin and Joni Mitchell, you know, that, that, were, that got their foot in folk music. And um, folk music's like a... Some of it I can't stick, you know. I've, I've often... <laughs> ended up working in the folk world as the time's gone on. And, and there's a the thing about folk music I can't stand, and there's a thing about folk music I absolutely love. And a lot of the things about um, folk music that I love is this sort of join between sort of folk and jazz, you know. So when I got the gig with um, Robert, for example, we, we ended up playing with a whole bunch of people. I just, I've just pulled out one programme from a festival 
So this is one of the festivals we played at. This is in Italy. And, you know, you know, we got to play with B.B. King and I got to hang out with B.B. King and, you know, I said hello to him or something like that, you know, which is one of the great moments, you know, because for me, you know, I think of all the people I've ever met in my life, B.B. King is, is the one that stays with me the most. That, you know, because this is a mythical character, really, for me growing up, you know, it's never someone you'd think you'd be in the same room as, you know, someone would walk up and say hello to you and you go, hi there, you know, that, that's an incredible thing. But... We, you know, we were playing on the bill with all sorts of different people, you know, and I got to meet a lot of these people. You know, I can remember playing with um, Steve Cropper, you know, at the Nice Jazz Festival. And his band was incredible, you know, because it was pretty much, you know, Booker T and the MGs that he was playing with. You know, and, I, and I got this young guy on drums and I thought, well... He can't be that good. And this guy was Keith Carlock, one of the greatest drummers in the world. And I can remember watching him play and just getting so intimidated and thought, oh, I'm going to have to have a walk around. So I walked around the festival and I, I saw that Pat Metheny was playing there and Herbie Hancock and Michael Brecker. And I can remember getting really like freaked out that I was about to go on and play, you know, alongside all these people. You know, I, I, I ended up playing in Switzerland with my hero. You know, we did a double headliner with Billy Cobham. Uh, absolutely mind-blowing and I can remember um you know we did a tour of Ireland with Van Morrison and I can remember saying to uh, Robert oh I'm not, I'm not I'm not really that keen on Van Morrison you know being an utter idiot and he then went out and gave me you know brought me a copy of Astral Weeks which is still in my collection and I can remember putting this on and looking down and going oh my god this is the modern jazz quartet now the modern jazz quartet is a group that I I grew up with from the year dot it was my my dad's favorite band and I thought what the hell's the Mon Jazz Quartet on this Van Morrison album and, and these connections have always fascinated me you know in in um, music and with playing with Robert that is what I found so interesting was being involved in a band that was exploring these weird influences and congruences and all this sort of stuff you know um, you know you know so uh, you know, there's so many albums and artists that are not necessarily jazz that I would like to talk to on this about on this channel, um, and a lot of that comes from my time when I was playing with Robert. You know, with the, having your ears opened up, you know, by this master musician and a, and a musician that really expects you to be as the best you possibly can. He's always searching for excellence and is searching for an excellence in an area where we're never sh too sure where it is, you know, never resting on his laurels. I, I really think Rob Plant, you know, in terms of um, artists from that era, you know, is possibly still the most forward thinking and, and, and the most creative of that generation that are still out there recording. You know, I really think that's the case. He's still foot forging, you know, forging forward because he's got a mind, you know, which is exploratory, you know. I've always felt like Robert's a bit like a musical big game hunter, you know, and he's out there, you know, to really have, get grab the whole lot, you know, and he's got the guts and drive to go and do that. Um, and um, for me, this was a real incredible experience. And then feeling like we were searching and we don't know what we're searching for, but there, it's in all this stuff, you know, and a, and, a, and a straight copy of any of these groups wouldn't have worked, but push it too far, and it doesn't work. It was trying to find that mix of, of the tradition and the new, you know, that was something that was really incredible, you know, about my time with the band. Um, I'm sure I'm going to come back and talk about this again. I haven't talk, talked about it before on the channel, but I thought it was about time, you know, and, and I really want to explore some of these other artists that I, I love, you know, the Joni Mitchells and the John Martins that I haven't spoken about on this channel. And I really wanted to kick off with this. And I'm going to show you one last time, you know, Absolutely incredible album. Go and check it out. Love by Forever Changes. You know, and it will open that door to that incredible time in America where, you know, culture was changing, that people had opened themselves up to new voices, new sounds, new ways of thinking. And these bands like Love were right in the middle of that. They were right there um, exploring new territories, you know, um, so much that we can be thankful for in our culture, especially things like humans' rights and acceptance of other types of people. 
is really comes from that exploratory openness that emerged in the 1960s when I think a generation looked to their parents who had gone through the war and had, and had could seen that there had been the promise of a new world and decided that they wanted a new world and they knew to get a new world they had to be open to new things and I think this is the great legacy of rock music and I use rock music very loosely to you know include all the incredible music that's happened in the last 50 years or so um, but especially from I suppose the year I was born which is 1968 you know I, I am someone who sits occupies my life or sit and occupy this era of, of rock music you know nowadays is, is it as is music as important culturally as it was back then you know I, I look at the demographic of people watching this video and it's all people my age and over you know but it's important to us and it's great to talk about it and let's just hold on to it a little bit longer before it dis di disappears into the ether like Egyptian hieroglyphs or romantic poetry. So that's my uh, chat about uh, love, forever changes and my time with Rock Plant and hopefully you enjoyed that and um, if you want some more of these chats I will do them. So like, subscribe, stick it in the comments what you think. Thanks for listening and see you soon. Bye.